Caregivers are an essential part of everyday living for millions of Canadians. It's an intense, high-stress job with many rewarding moments. Today's guest has personal experience in this area and he's cared for his beautiful wife, Gracie, who lives with severe disabilities for 33 plus years. He is the host of the weekly radio show, Hope for the Caregiver, president of Standing with Hope and author of the book, Hope for the Caregiver. Peter Rosenberger, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you on today. It is a treat to be with you all. So uh, Peter, tell us, um, how many people are caregivers in the United States? And I believe you have statistics on Canada as well. Well, it's a hard number to actually quantify because a lot of times they talk about caregivers for those who are caring for the aging, uh, senior citizens, so forth. And that's about a 42 million number in, in America. But then you throw in special needs children. Then you throw in mentally ill. Then you throw in what I do on my show and what I talk about, alcoholics and addicts. Uh, the, the alcoholism and addiction is a chronic impairment. Even if you're in recovery, you're still dealing with that impairment. And anybody that's in the orbit of that individual, they know that individual is chronically impaired. And that wherever you find a, uh, somebody who's chronically impaired, you're going to find a caregiver. So most experts in the United States are hovering around that 65 million range for the family caregiver in the United States. And in Canada, it's 8 to, to 11 million. Um, there's again, it's hard to quantify that number because a lot of people don't identify as such. They don't think of themselves as a caregiver. I did a, a whole bit uh, a couple of years ago with comedian Jeff Foxworthy on you might be a caregiver if, oh, wow. and you know if uh, if you've ever hooked up your wife's wheelchair to your dog just to see if it would work, you're probably a caregiver. I mean that's you know I was trying to do something that would kind of make people think of a little bit different about that, and uh, it's okay to laugh at that by the way. That's funny. <laughs> and, you know, okay. if, if you get more than six Christmas cards from a doctor, you're probably a caregiver, you know. And so the people don't think of themselves as such. And I'm helping reframe that conversation so people understand why is this important? Wh what am I doing here? Where is this going? And how do I do it better or safer? Yeah. Now, you are a caregiver yourself. You, uh, let's talk about how you became one and what has the journey been like for you? Well, I became one when I said I do, and then I did, uh, because my wife was hurt several years before I even met her. She had a really bad car wreck when she was a teenager, 17 years old. She had the world by the tail, and uh, she was at school uh, at, a, at a music school in Nashville, Tennessee. I was at a different school in South Carolina at the time, didn't know her. I transferred in as she was recuperating out of uh, after the wreck. She came back, and friends said, you got to meet this girl. And um, they said, she's had a really bad wreck, but you, you, you guys are gonna really hit it off. And she's the most spunky girl. You talked to her yesterday. Uh, she is, um, uh, she's got a personality as big as the state we live in, which is Montana. And beautiful, beautiful young gal. I mean, when I saw her, I mean, I was, you know, don't take my word for it, Google her. I was Googling her that day. We didn't even have Google back then. <laughs> and, I, and then I heard her sing and I was a pianist. She's a singer, and it was all over at that point, and I knew I was going to take care of her. She had a limp. Uh, I saw some scars on her lower legs at first, you know, and I you know, knew that, that she'd had some tough times, but had no concept of this, of what this meant. She'd had about 20 surgeries by the time I met her in the mid-'80s. We got married, and the doctor said, um, look, if you guys are going to have kids, you have them when you're young. And so I went to her, and I said, baby, the doctor says we got to do this. And I got a prescription and everything. And I don't know if that's covered under Obamacare, but I bet you that's covered under Clinton care. And, and I, so we had two children, but, but it accelerated some of the day. That's funny, by the way, y'all could laugh at that. That is just really <laughs> funny and y'all should laugh harder. But we had our sons and uh, after each son, she gave up one of her legs. It just accelerated the damage that was going on with her crushed limbs. The surgeries just kept mounting. To date that I could count, she's had 80 that I can count and about another 150 smaller procedures. She's been treated by over a hundred doctors in 12 different hospitals. And the bill is now well over 11 million. It just keeps growing. It's really kind of hard to keep track of all of it. I'm, I'm ballparking on that one, and that's a low ballpark. So and she lives with severe pain all the time, all the time and uh, not known a day without it since Reagan was president in oh. his first term. 
So, so that's, a, that's a long time to deal with disability and challenges and heartache and frustration. And I've come to understand where the real battle is for the family caregiver. And, it's, uh, and, and this is why I wrote the book. This is why I did the show. This is why I'm here with you today, because I understand how dark and, and, and discouraging those places can be when you're having a late night conversation with the ceiling fan thinking, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And so that's my story. Yeah, that's unbelievable what you two have been through. And I can see that you use humor a lot, which is which is great. It's a great coping Well, I like to call it humor. Yeah. From your reaction, I was unclear if it was humor. But, I, you know, <laughs> some things don't translate to Canada. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. Don't worry about it. Everyone will get it. Okay, so... Obviously, you've got a lot of experience in this. What kind of advice can you give to those who might recognize that they could eventually become a caregiver, possibly to like aging parents? Is there anything that they can do to plan for it? Yes. First off, if you love somebody, you will probably be a caregiver. If you live long enough, you're probably going to need one. So it, we all got a stake in this. It's a slow, uh, creeping reality that that we don't think about because we're always so busy right here in the in the here and now but there's several things you can do to prepare for this one of them is make sure your home is ready when you're 50 60 years old don't go buy a three-story home with a whole lot of stairs and the living the living part is way up on top don't do that that's not a good idea make sure that you've got wider doorways handicap accessible things you you know we're all one sprained ankle away from being um in a tough situation in our own home. So let's go ahead and plan for that. Another thing is we've got to start taking care of ourselves and being good stewards, planning financially, planning physically with our bodies and things such as that, because it is coming. And then if you have a special needs child that comes in and, you know, all of a sudden you've brought this child into the world, there are things to do prepare for that once, once that reality hits of what you can do. And, uh, but it all starts with the heart. And my, 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 my message is for caregivers, healthy caregivers make better caregivers. Mm-hmm. And if you're morbidly obese, how is that going to help you take care of someone else? I see too many people who are really heavy pushing wheelchairs. And I know it. I wrote a book called Seven Caregiver Landmines. Excessive weight gain is one of those. I know. I got so big it took two dogs to bark at me. I know. I get it. You know, we we get we we reach for the the comfort food that was funny by the way too, and um, it, it's you know I got a million of those. I got so big I broke my family tree. I mean I got big, and 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 I understand that, but we've got to dial that back in. And but the heavy weight that we really carry is not around our waist; it's around our heart. And so what I do is try to speak to that heart of the caregiver to let them know number one. You, if you're in this situation right now, which there are millions of people in Canada dealing with this right now, you're in this situation now, hey, you know what? You didn't cause it. You can't cure it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It's, that's not yours to fix. You're a steward of this. Now, we don't talk about stewardship a lot in our society. I don't know what you guys do up there in Canada, but in America, we're $24 trillion in debt. Stewardship is clearly not on the t- uh, top of mind of everybody in America. And we got people burning down our cities and everything else. Stewardship is not where our headspace is. But for caregivers, that's where it has to be. It really has to be for all of us. But I'm just going to focus on caregivers. Mm -hmm. We are stewards of somebody who is suffering or impaired or struggling. We are not owners or fixers. That's the big thing to keep in mind. You can't fix these things. I don't have any power over amputation. My wife's lost both legs. And her body is orthopedically a train wreck. I have no power over that. But I have a lot of power over being a jerk. That, absolutely. Uh, that's right. That's I got right. a lot of power over that. And so that's where the battle is for us as caregivers. Can we live peacefully with things that we don't particularly like? Right. Now, in your book, you use three positive words for high-stress moments. They are wait, water, and walk. What do you mean by that? Well... You know, I never get it. I never have to make amends for something I didn't say, you know, and sometimes we are we are so quick to blurt out some stuff and we want to jump into it. And and for us as caregivers, you know, we're often required to learn to bite our tongue and enjoy the taste of blood, you know, because we want to pop off and say things. Just wait, just wait. 
just breathe. Just take a deep breath. Four seconds in, eight seconds out. And calm yourself down. If that's not enough, drink some water. A lot of times we reach for sodas or high sugary drinks or whatever. Please, for all that is good in this world, avoid drinking things like Red Bull as a caregiver. It is not good for you. And we don't need to be so amped up. Our life is like this anyway. So drink some water. Drink to think. We need to hydrate. And water gives us a chance to get our blood pressure down. Also, it fills our mouth with something besides words. We don't always have to go to every fight we get a ticket to. They're going to say things that our family members are going to say things or doctors or nurses or somebody's going to say to pastors, church people come up to you. Well, if you had enough faith, this would, you wouldn't be going through this. Well, they don't say that to me anymore. I'm a second degree black belt. So I usually know how to deal with that kind of nonsense. <laughs> and I'm helping get people, help people get better theology in this too, because we got really terrible theology when it comes to suffering, but drink. Okay, just drink, not, I mean, wait, let me clarify, drink water. <laughs> Don't just, just clarify that. Don't drink red drink wine water. is what you're saying. And the, and the last thing is go for a walk if you need to. Wait, water, walk. You don't have to engage on all these things. It's okay to let some of this go. That's interesting. That's good advice too. Now, in your book, you also mentioned that there are six major impact areas affected by caregiving. What are they? Well, you got your health, your emotions, your lifestyle, your profession, your money, and your endurance. You put it all together, it says, help me. And that's the, the cry for us as caregivers. All, all of these things are affected, but it starts with your heart. If your head and heart are squirrely, guess what? Your wallet will soon follow. If, if you are a train wreck in your darkest places in your heart, guess what? Your body will soon be that way too. It's just, it, and so if you can detangle this stuff in the heart, then we give every part of our, our living existence a fighting chance in dealing with these realities. So that's where I focus, but it's always about help me, help me, not help us, not help her, help me. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm in a good place, my wife who has all these things going on with her has a fair shot at having some things help with her. But if I'm in a bad place, what's gonna happen to her? Yeah, it's almost like the caregiver needs a caregiver sometimes, right? I can, it's just, it sounds like such a hard job. I don't give a lot of instruction to my fellow caregivers on the air or anywhere else. What I try to give is reminders because I think that's where our, our battle is. We, we, I, you can't tell me how to take care of my wife. I can't tell you how to take care of your family member, but we can remind each other of where safety is in the army. Sometimes the leader is the guy that remembers where the Jeep is parked, hmm. you know, and, and, and we can remind each other of where safety is. Have you seen your doctor lately? Have you been to a counselor lately? Uh -huh. When's the last time that you went for a walk? Right. And these yeah. are, that's good that's advice for the caregivers. You also mentioned that there are three eyes that every caregiver suffers from. What are they? Every one of us lose their independence. We become isolated and then we lose our identity. And that loss of identity is such a um, debilitating thing for family caregivers. Ask a caregiver, how are you doing? They say, well, she had a bad night or I'm not doing, I mean, I mean, uh, she had a bad night or he's had a bad night or we're not doing so well. They struggle with saying I. And so what I do on my show, when, when I have a caller that calls, it's a live show, and I always ask, how are you feeling? And it's amazing how many times they have to start and reposition again to be able to go back and say, I'm tired, I'm scared, I'm just hacked off. I, I don't know what to do. I don't care what comes after the word I. We can have a real conversation at that point because then they start speaking and they're probably stuttering and, 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 and tears will fill up their eyes. A lot of, I've, I've seen this over and over and over when they start speaking from their heart but I try to give them enough space to be able to do that so that they can express what's going on there, get it all on the table. Now let's have a real conversation. Oh, that's so interesting. And you're absolutely right. They, you do lose your identity and you start to take on, almost project your personality onto the other person or they get projected back onto you. That is so interesting. And it's, it really drives home the fact of how much caregivers need other people in their lives too, right? Like counseling. And I would imagine they suffer from guilt a lot of times and worry and just all kinds of stresses. 
Guilt, is, guilt really, really cripples caregivers. Yeah. Uh, I, I call it part of the fog of caregivers, fear, obligation, and guilt. And we get lost in the fog. Yeah. Parents feel guilty for bringing a child into this world with special needs. Uh, you feel guilty if your loved one can't get up and go and just stand up and take a shower. You feel guilty if you can get up and go and, and walk around the block and they can't. There are a lot of things to feel, not just sins that get great press. There are a lot of things to feel guilty about. You feel guilty if you just want to sit down and watch a television show uninterrupted for an hour. Wow. I, I try wow. to help caregivers work through that a little bit and start using the word grace. I love that word grace. It's my favorite word in the English language. I married a woman named Grace and I love the word grace. And we've got to learn how to to apply that in our own lives so that we can live peacefully with very, very painful things. Well, Peter Rosenberger, we are out of time. Unfortunately, I would love to go on talking to you for hours and hours, and I'm sure you have so much to say on this topic. Thank you so much for joining us today, though. Thank you all for having me. I mean, I, I hope my Southern accent translates over to the North, <laughs> and, uh, but thank you. you'll probably use subtitles, but thanks for having me. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you so much. That was Peter Rosenberger, president of Standing with Hope and the author of the book, Hope for the Caregiver.